I ended the last devlog pretty abruptly while talking about the poor performance that was caused by there being too many active resources after a long playtime. And seeing how I want people to be able to play my game for at least a little while, this is not acceptable. And in case this is the first devlog you see, I'm developing a first person survival shooter game on board a giant vehicle in a frozen wasteland. And in this devlog I'll be focusing on the optimizations I've done in my game regarding resources and bullets, as well as talk graphics and terrain generation. So I've first tried to solve this performance issue with the resources by implementing Frost and Culling, the technique of not rendering anything that's outside of your screen, where I also added the possibility of a rendered distance. And I even made it multi-threaded and optimized, but apparently Unity already does this for you. So all of that work was useless and had to be scrapped as it actually decreased performance. Additionally, while trying to improve the performance of resources, I somehow made all of the trees become alive which is uh, definitely interesting to say the least. I did however get a much better idea, where instead of spending CPU performance to only save GPU performance via less things needing rendering, we can spend CPU performance to save GPU and CPU performance as well as saving memory. This is done by a system I've called Destructive Culling, where once a resource zone gets too far away from the player or the vehicle, all of its resources get destroyed so the CPU doesn't have to process the entities at all since they don't exist, which means that the colliders, transforms, rendering and everything else doesn't have to happen, and we don't have thousands of resources vibing in memory either. However, to prevent zones being respawned and destroyed again and again when they're just on the edge of the render distance, we have an additional buffer distance for destroying them, which means that once a resource becomes visible, it has to get slightly further away before it gets destroyed. However, my first implementation wasn't that good, as I was adding and removing components to the resource zones to keep track of which needed to respawn or get destroyed, which led to a bunch of structural changes, which is where Unity has to move my zone entities around in memory every single frame. This ended up costing close to half a millisec, where 16.6 milliseconds equates to 60 FPS, and that is for only 360 zones. I did however manage to fix this without too much by just using a component with four different states representing what it had to do. Which as you can see, removed all of the add and remove components calls from the profiler, saving us a noticeable amount of performance. Now I just have to optimize the spawning and despawning more if it becomes a problem in the future. However, what happens if someone harvests all resources in a zone? Or if they take some of the resources and then leave before coming back again later. To provide some resource permanence, I made it so that resource zones keep track of which resource entities have been destroyed, which means that then skip spawning these back. And if all resources of a zone have been destroyed, then we destroy that zone as well. However, this solution does come with some memory overhead from having to track all of the resources in each zone, but it's a worthwhile trade-off as we save a noticeable amount of performance. But now that we've talked about optimizing our resources, let's talk about making them prettier by making a nice snow shader for the rocks. Can you guess where I got it from? Brackies, of course. With yet another useful tutorial, I made a triplanar shader with a variable snow direction, where any surface of the rock that points enough in this direction will have a secondary snow texture applied to, which means that we can get some snow on top or the sides of the rocks. However, just changing the texture is a bit boring, so I added some vertex displacement to make it look like snow accumulating, but it gets pretty weird along the seams of the model. So I need to figure out how to do dynamic tessellation for the snow so it actually looks better. But I have already found a nice video tutorial for this, but I've yet to actually implement it. Additionally, I also replaced the resource models yet again, but this time I only replaced the trees with some nice medium poly trees I found on the asset store, which look a lot closer to my original idea. And they also look a lot better as they're more fluffy looking and they got that sort of dishonored vibe. I do however need to redesign them a bit with higher texture resolutions and a snow shader for the branches similar to the one I use for the rocks. The terrain was actually pretty simple to convert from mono behaviors to entities, as I reused basically all of the code except for having to, you know, swap the colliders from being a mono behavior collider to a ECS collider. And I did also get some weird issues where getting the spacing of the pieces right didn't quite seem to work out correct. And for some reason, generating mesh colliders in Unity is more demanding for ECS colliders than the mono behavior implementation with FizzX which I assume is because of extra safety checks. Unfortunately, this meant that I had to reduce the detail of each terrain piece to keep the performance decent enough, 
but I will need to redesign the system as it's not working correctly nor performing well enough. So at the moment the terrain is just mostly flat as a bad workaround. Additionally I also need to redo the vehicle movement system so that it follows the shape of the terrain as right now it just moves straight forward without changing its angle or Y position. Additionally the vehicle also needs to have some terrain limits imposed on it so that it can't climb up mountains like horses in Skyrim and so that it feels better to drive it so that you have to avoid large obstacles such as too big rocks or very big mountains. So that might be something I show in a later devlog once I've gotten around to actually implementing that. But now for the part that I hinted at in the first devlog. 400,000 bullets are flying with gravity being applied to them, checking for collisions every single frame with support for armor, armor piercing and bullet penetration through walls. Slightly slimmer though, my PC has 24 threads so that is why I'm able to have so many bullets active. I started off very simply by just modeling bullets with a physics body and applying a forward velocity to them and letting Unity figure out the physics. But that was much too slow as it couldn't even handle 15,000 bullets before dipping below 30 FPS and lagging. This is partially due to them colliding with other bullets and due to there only being 32 bullet entities per ECS chunk leading to poor memory utilization. So let's fix that by removing colliders and do Raycast based collision instead but still using Unity physics for the trajectories of the bullets. If you ignore the issue with the physics simulation completely freezing for some seconds when catching up, it's actually pretty good. Up to roughly 40,000 bullets before going below 30 FPS. Removing the colliders brought the entity counter per archetype up to 42, which gives better memory layout and therefore more performance. However, I did run into a very typical problem with multi-threading. Which is when you have multiple threads that want to write to the same object, which value do you keep? When using a multi-threaded system for bullet collisions, multiple bullets can deal damage to an object during the same frame. This means that if 100 bullets hit a wall during a frame, the wall only registers a damage from one bullet, which is not quite correct. So I had to figure out a solution, since it is preferable to be able to kill enemies. To solve this, I created a queue that supports parallel writing, and on collision, each bullet then adds an entry saying which entity they want to damage and the amount of damage it should deal. The main thread then processes this queue and applies the damage, preventing any inaccuracies from occurring due to the multi-threading, commonly known as a race condition. However, the performance can be even better. Since the bullets have no interaction with the physics world, as in they don't push anything around, they don't themselves bounce off of walls or anything, we don't actually need to have them be simulated by the unity physics. Additionally, by removing all of the components necessary for the physics simulation and then adding in our own bullet system that applies the velocity and gravity to each bullet, we can save a lot of performance. After removing all those unnecessary components, the bullet count per chunk is up to 64, which is half the max number of entities per chunk in unity. This improvement gives us even better memory layout and improves performance significantly, with 140,000 bullets at 30 FPS. But what if I told you it could be even better? I moved the collision and the trajectory code from an entity stuff for each into an IJUP chunk, which seems to have less overhead, doing this and using some wonderful simmed instructions to improve the performance even further, where simmed is single instruction, multiple data, which allows the CPU to process many data elements with a single instruction. For example, add the velocity to multiple bullets in a single instruction, which means that processing the trajectory of 90,000 bullets now takes 0.17 milliseconds, since it's split over 23 threads, which is 4 milliseconds across the entire CPU. Also, I just quickly want to interject with a showcase of the beauty of Unity Starts. With less than 10 lines of code, we have a multi-threaded system that iterates over all entities with a health component and checks if they have less than 0 HP, and if so destroys them and their entire hierarchy. However, now the bullet collision system is the most demanding part, where the bullet flight system is barely noticeable. Processing the collisions when shooting at a penetrable wall that also takes damage when there's 160,000 bullets in the air results in around 10,000 collisions with the wall per frame, which takes 49 milliseconds to process. But due to me having 23 threads, it takes 2.13 milliseconds of noticeable time. Which leads us to this. Bullets flying are cheap, bullets hitting something that can't take damage is less cheap, and bullets hitting something that can take damage has armor and has a bullet penetration modifier is expensive, so standing far away and shooting into an expensive wall allows us to have 400,000 bullets in the air at once while hovering around 30 fps in editor. 
However, if I were to shoot at a cheap surface, for example shooting straight up into the air so that the bullets ray casts don't hit anything at all, we can have more than a million bullets flying through the air at a surprisingly decent FPS of around 20, so it's almost a cinematic bullet swarm experience. Which is definitely way more than I will ever need, but it's very good to have the support for it, and it also means that the bullets will hopefully never be the performance bottleneck for anyone with a weaker system. And should it ever not be enough performance, I have some ideas for how to make it even faster. However, if we, you know, just keep shooting, then we can have 2 million bullets running in the editor at around 15 FPS. But considering that the bullet count during normal gameplay is going to be closer to 1000 at most and not hundreds of thousands or millions is plenty fast. And just in case anyone complains that it's only possible because the scene is empty, here's 1 million bullets with the resources active running at around 20 FPS. Right, so that's everything about the bullets. And in the next devlog I'll go over the enemy and turret systems I'm currently working on, as well as a sort of enemy wave system to add some sort of danger to the game, other than just environmental hazards. But I've yet to actually develop those things, so don't expect the next devlog too soon. So. If you don't want to miss the following devlogs, there's a very nice subscribe button below this video you can click on, and you can always unsubscribe if you don't like the devlogs. Additionally, only 5% of you guys are subscribed. If you have any feedback about the game or ideas for something that could be cool, or have some questions about the implementation of certain features, just write a comment and hopefully I'll be able to give some information. 